Okay, so let's dive in. We're going to dive in and first start with just some general stuff that we know about Mars. We've got the first four planets from the sun on the slide right here. And uh, from left to right, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. Take a look at Mars. It's about half the size of Earth. Um, for then comparison, our moon is about half the size of Mars. Um, so if Earth is about 8,000 miles across, Mars is about 4,000 miles across, and our moon is about 2,000 miles across. Total coincidence on that. Um, so if you're looking for any sort of number pattern, don't. It's a, it's a coincidence. Um, but to give you a sense of the actual size, because you kind of go, okay, half the size of Earth, big deal. Um, what else can I, can I compare that to? Well, if Earth was a hollow ball and you filled it with Mars marbles, you could, fit, you could fit six Mars marbles inside a hollow ball Earth. So that gives you a sense of the volume. It's actually not that big. Um, if you took all the land mass of Earth that's above water, remember Earth's surface is 70% water, only 30% of our planet is, is dry land. And so if you take all that land surface above water on Earth, that's about equal to the land surface of Mars. So we think that's a big space, but actually compared to the rest of Earth that's covered in water, um, it's actually not that big. The gravitational pull of Mars is about one third that of Earth. Um, so you would experience less gravity uh, on the surface of Mars. Let's put that another way. If you weigh 100 pounds on the Earth, instant weight loss going to Mars, you would weigh about 38 pounds. You're still made of the same amount of stuff. So you're not actually losing weight. It's just the gravitational pull of Mars is less. And so you would not be able to have the, the scale register as much weight. But in terms of mass, in terms of the amount of stuff you're made of, still the same amount of stuff. Um, so it sounds good to be able to do that, but you're not actually losing real honest to goodness weight. You're just uh, lowering the gravitational pull. Mars is, I mentioned the fourth planet from the sun. It's um, about another... 45-ish million miles farther out that, it, that its orbit is. Um, the distance between the planets can, can differ depending on where we are around the sun and where Mars is around the sun. At its closest, Mars can be 36, 40 million miles away, something like that. At its farthest, when we're on one side of the sun and Mars is on the other side of the sun, we're talking uh, 142 million plus 93 million, we're talking like almost 250 million miles away. So um, so it can be pretty far. If you've ever observed Mars in the sky, like in the la like last year, you may remember that Mars was fairly bright, that bright orange thing that was in the sky. Um, that was Mars. But that's when we were kind of close to it. We are getting farther away from it. And so Mars, it is still up in the sky, but it is dimmer. Um, than it was then because we are just physically farther away. The average temperature on Earth um, is about 57 degrees. So that is uh, average over the entire surface of the Earth. The average over the entire surface of Mars is minus 81 degrees Fahrenheit. Let's put that another way. The highest temperature on Mars near the equator is, is about 85, 80 degrees, 86 degrees, somewhere in that range, 80 something degrees Fahrenheit. The lowest temperature at the coldest point of, of southern hemisphere Martian winter, it can get down to a balmy 284 degrees below zero. Next time we think that Chicago's weather is cold, just compare it to Mars. You'll instantly feel better. It's not that bad. <laughs> it's not that bad here. It's it's awful there. Um, the Martian winter in the southern hemisphere is so cold that some of the air starts to freeze to the ground. It's that cold, right? And this is a screenshot from a few months ago, but the data is still pretty similar. Um, just to give you a sense of the of the one day range, high temperature to low temperature uh, on Mars in this particular location, this is the uh, Curiosity rover, which landed in 2012, where its weather station is, it recorded a high temperature that day of 41 degrees Fahrenheit. Cool. 
it recorded that day a low temperature of 90 degrees below zero. And the reason for that is the air pressure on Mars, the amount of air is less than that of Earth. So Mars's air is very thin. There's just not that much air to hold in the heat. So while it may feel warm-ish during the day, the temperature plummets at night because there's just not a, a lot of air to hold the heat and, and not a lot of air moving around to mix any of that heat around. And actually that, that, uh, that temperature can even drop as you get above the surface, not that far above the, above the surface of the ground. So you might be 40 degrees at the ground and you might be a, a lower temperature 10 feet up. Again, there's just not a lot of air to mix that that heat around and and, uh, and warm the place up. So it sounds like it's a cool place to go, but it's actually a cold place to go. Now, this particular slide uh, in the for the Earth on the left, um, we we have a pretty good idea of what the center of the Earth is like. It's not that like we've dug down to 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 the center of the Earth, we can tell from earthquakes, basically the way Earth jiggles, we can tell what the interior is like without having to dig in. We haven't been able to do that yet with Mars. There is a spacecraft there right now called InSight, and it is measuring Mars quakes. So we've got earthquakes on Earth, we have Mars quakes on Mars. And so those, those jiggles, those quakes, if they're strong enough, they can help us determine what the interior of Mars is like, again, without having to, to dig down. Mars has two moons. Um, they are pretty small. Note the size at the bottom of each one. Phobos on the left is almost 14 miles across. Deimos on the right is almost eight miles across. How big did I say our moon was? It's about 2,000 miles across. These are teeny tiny moons. You could put these moons within the borders of the city of Chicago and you'd have room left over. These are not big places, right? And um, if I show you a close up of Phobos, you, you would probably, oh, by the way, the name Phobos means panic. You know the word phobia, that's where we get that word from. And so Phobos, the moon, its name means panic. Deimos means fear. And these were uh, Mars, the god of war, these were the horses that drove his chariot. So his horses had names, panic and fear. Um, and so take a look at this picture. You probably can notice right away. It's probably the two features that you probably noticed right away. That big old crater, that big old hole on the, on the right-hand side. And then those, it looks like stripes uh, along the surface. And where scientists think those stripes came from is Phobos is slowly getting closer to Mars. Mars's gravity is pulling on Phobos and starting to pull the moon apart it will not totally come apart for about another 30 to 50 million years. Don't set your watch. <laughs> this is not gonna happen in our lifetime. But we can already start to see the effects of Mars's gravity pulling on Phobos and, and actually starting to uh, create stretch marks um, as, uh, as the moon gets a little closer and a little closer to uh, Mars. Again, 30 to 50 million years in the future, we've got a ways to go. Um, all right, I'll do a couple more slides and then I'll stop and see if there are any more, any questions to start with. Here we've got the planet itself. This is a fairly true color picture. We call Mars the red planet. It is not red, it, at least not red like a stop sign. Um, it is kind of a kind of a caramel color, kind of a butterscotch color, kind of a rust color, all right? We'll talk about those three splotches that are off to the, the left in just a second. That, that scar, that big uh, gash that you see across the middle, that is uh, a canyon and that is called Vallis Marineris. And that canyon is almost five miles deep. For comparison, the Grand Canyon in Arizona is about a mile deep. And the canyon itself, again, just to compare, the Grand Canyon is from one end to another, a couple hundred miles in length. The Valles Marineris on Mars is over 2,000, or about 2,000 miles in length. So you, it would stretch basically from one end of the United States to the other. The splotches off to the left are volcanoes. 
and Mars has, as far as we know, extinct volcanoes. We don't think they have erupted any time recently, um, but that largest one to the upper left in this picture is called Olympus Mons, Mount Olympus, and those three smaller ones are the ones that you saw in the picture here. Mount uh, Olympus Mons isn't in this picture, um, but it is in this one. And so these are called shield volcanoes. Basically, these volcanoes erupted in one spot and one spot only over and over and over, and they got taller and taller and bigger and bigger. And Olympus Mons is uh, the largest volcano in the solar system. It is about a little over 70,000 feet tall. If Earth's crust did not move, we might have ended up with an Olympus Mons sized volcano on Earth. And that would have been a place that you may have visited, you may know about it, you may have heard of it, called Hawaii. The Hawaiian Islands uh, formed because of a shield volcano, of a volcano erupting in one spot. But the crust above where that hot spot was moved off to the northwest. And so you've got these smaller islands off to the northwest, but that hot spot stayed in one location. Um, so the biggest island, the, the big island of Hawaii, um, is, is formed from an active volcano. Um, again, this volcano, as far as we know, is not active, but to give you a sense of how big it is, this picture is actually scaled to the size of one end of, of Hawaii to Kauai. So this is actually scaled real size here. Put another way. Um, Olympus Mons is the diameter of the state of Arizona and the square mileage of the state of New Mexico. This is a big volcano. So tall are these volcanoes that water ice clouds form almost daily around the tops of these volcanoes and those kind of whitish splotches that you see are clouds. Um, Mars does have clouds, kind of thin ones, uh, but the Curiosity rover has taken pictures of some of these. So these are some of the clouds over Gale Crater, uh, where Curiosity is located. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing for a second, and we'll stop and see if there are any questions. So if you want to relay some questions, go right ahead. Yeah, we have some really great questions. So Portia has a question that I think you might be getting to soon, but uh, she would like to know what the rover's name is. Oh, um, the one that's uh, uh, arriving at Mars soon, that mm -hmm. one? Its name is Perseverance. Perseverance. So, yep, so we had um, Sojourner, which was the first rover on Mars, and that one landed in 1997. It was kind of the size of a, of a boot box, a big shoe box. And then in 2004, we had Spirit and Opportunity. And then Curiosity, was, which is the rover that landed in 2012, and Perseverance is the name of the rover that's arriving in February. Oh, I would love to be the person that gets to name these rovers. That was a seventh grade student from the state of Virginia. Ah, I love it. <laughs> um, Portia also just commented that it would be really easy to lift weights on Mars because yeah. you would be like a bodybuilder. You'd be lifting like refrigerators. I don't really know. But <laughs> it'd be, it, it, they'd have the same amount of mass. So they'd be harder to, they'd be hard to get going. But yeah, once you got them going, they would, they would go pretty, pretty easily. So, yeah. So that brings us to another really good question. Um, and that is a question that Mark W. asked. Um, he would like to know if the gravity of a planet is proportional to its diameter. Like, would you be heavier on Jupiter because it's a really big planet? It's, it's proportional to its mass. So, but that also has to do with its diameter. So yes, Jupiter has more gravity, but it has a lot of mass. So mass determines gravity. You can have something be a really big diameter but it's very, it, it's not dense at all. It's very lightweight, not a lot of stuff in it. You would have, you wouldn't have a lot of, a lot of gravity for that thing. You could have something the same diameter and be very dense and it would have more mass and therefore more gravity. So your gravity is dependent on um, how much mass you're talking about and how much diameter you're talking about as well. Got it. So um, on the subject of gravity, now at U of I, I was not a science major, but I did take rocks for jocks. Um, and I remember that two, you know, two objects 
will be pulled together, you know, just by virtue of their mass. Um, that's kind of how gravity works. And so uh -huh. Mimi would like to know if our moon is being pulled in toward Earth too. Um, pulled in as in getting closer to, to Earth? No. Um, the moon is, is orbiting the Earth and it is slowly moving away from the Earth. So that can happen as well. They, the, the two objects orbit around a center of mass, but slowly the moon is moving away at about a rate of about an inch and a half a year, or put another way, about the same rate that your fingernails grow. Oh, that's an interesting thought, isn't it? <laughs> uh, Mark W. also wanted to know if the pictures you're sharing will be posted anywhere. They're just really cool pics. Or can we get them at the Adler Planetarium? Um, they're, they're basically all NASA pictures. So you can, uh, uh, there's a website, uh, mars.nasa.gov. And you can access a lot of pictures from a lot of the Mars missions. Um, so yeah, these are all publicly available. There's no secret repository to, to see. Cool. Anybody, so, Very yeah. cool. So Mark, if you are having trouble finding uh, pictures, just contact the library. We'd be happy to help you. There you go. Um, so Wayne said Phobos is small and irregularly shaped, and he'd like to know how big it would have to be in order to be spherical. Um, it would probably, at the density that it is, it would probably have to be several hundred miles in diameter to be spherical. Um, wow. Case in point, the asteroid Ceres is the largest asteroid in the asteroid belt. And it is, if I remember right, about 600 miles across. It is the only spherical asteroid. Um, the, the, the next size that I remember is, is asteroid Vesta. That's uh, the fourth asteroid that was discovered. It's about 200 miles across, and it's not spherical. So you need to have enough mass to pull your shape into a sphere. So not everything in the universe is spherical because it's just not big enough. Um, but if you have enough mass and therefore enough gravity to pull you into a spherical shape, uh, then then you will be like Ceres. But in, the, in this case, these little guys are like potatoes. They're they're very they look lumpy. like potatoes. Yeah, <laughs> that's the first thing I thought when I saw those pictures. Okay, a couple more questions. Um, Kay would like to know if Mount Sharp is a volcano. No, it isn't. Um, Mount Sharp, they're they're still. Uh, trying to figure out exactly how it formed it, it so we'll talk about this um the crater where the curiosity rover landed is called gale crater and it has a mountain in the middle of it and it may be like a, a wind and water driven mountain meaning wind and water conspired to create that mound in the middle of the crater um so it's about three miles tall but no it's not a volcano um it is something that wind and water likely formed Interesting. So Mark L. would like to know, when will Mars be at its closest to Earth again? Uh, it will be in uh, 26 months from October of last year. So whatever that is. Uh, is that December-ish December of 22? 2022? Yeah, yeah. So that's when it's at its closest next, although it's not as close as the last time uh, the October of, uh, of last year, and that wasn't as close as it was in July of 2018. Um, so 2018 is when we had the closest in the last 15 years, and then 2020 is, is, was the next closest. 2022, it's going to be a little farther away at its closest, and then it won't be back to its closest again until, I think it's 2034. Five, I believe. I think it's 2035 is, is when it's about as close as it was like last year. I'm bringing you to trivia whenever it opens back up. <laughs> okay, so um, Mark W. has another question. Where did the Mars moons come from? Were they part of Mars or were they like asteroids that kind of ended up in the orbit? Yeah, they, they think maybe the original bodies may have been captured asteroids, uh, un, unknown for certain. Um, but Phobos and Deimos in their current state may not be exactly what they've always looked like. Um, so it may have been another object that got pulled too close to Mars and it got pulled apart. All that stuff scattered around Mars. It formed a ring, maybe. 
And then some of that stuff started clumping together and formed a thing. And that thing maybe got a little too close and it formed another ring. And some of that stuff kind of rained out and, and, and clumped together. Phobos and Deimos could be some ring material, some former, some former something else that broke apart. Some of that stuff clumped back together, broke apart. Some of that stuff clumped back together. So this may happen several times. Um, uh, around Mars, maybe that's that's oh, a that's a hypothesis or, that I read um, about a year ago about about the origins of Phobos and Deimos. So they themselves may not have been captured asteroids. It may have been something else that got too close to Mars, broke apart, reformed, broke apart, reformed, and what you see is is kind of the second or third or whatever generation of that stuff. Wow, that's so interesting. So a couple of questions about what is on Mars. Portia would like to know how much iron Mars has, and Marion would like to know if there's water on Mars. Well, I'm gonna to get to the water topic in just a second, so hold that thought. Um, in terms of iron, um, not as far as we know, not as much as say the Earth has. Um, so Earth has, a, has an iron core, an iron middle, and either, Mars's may not be as big as Earth's, it may not exist like that. We're not really sure. Um, the surface of Mars definitely has iron, some iron incorporated into some of the rocks. Um, so that that happens. Um, but as far as the, the quantity on the inside, we haven't figured that out yet. Interesting. So um, Rana would like to know, could Olympus Mons erupt again? It could. Um, we think probably not, but you never say never in astronomy. <laughs> Time <laughs> is so long that, that uh, you go, well, maybe someday. But it's more than likely that um, the interior of Mars has cooled off. And so there may be some molten rock down in there way down deep, but it's not the, the pressure of that trying to get out is not strong enough to break through the the rock that has solidified above it so um so the crust may be fairly thick and or at least thick enough that the that the rock the molten stuff down below can't break through so never say never um it, it could still erupt but it's the the farther we go the less likely that is it could happen Unlikely. okay so um, the iron that you mentioned that might be in some of the rocks on Mars, um, Anisha, and I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, uh, is wondering if that's what gives Mars its red planet. Nickname. Yeah, yeah. So um, the the basically the the reddish color comes from a, a mineral called hematite, which is an iron bearing mineral um, that normally is a gray color. And if you grind this stuff really finely, like to a powder, that's when that reddish color, you can see that reddish color. Um, so the, the, the red color, the reddish, brownish, whatever you want to call it, um, is due to iron in the soil, but it's not it's not necessarily rusted, as in water fell on it and rusted it. We call it rust red, but it's not. It's more due to the size of the little bits um, that you see that red color. A, a bigger version of, of of that those little red bits is a is a gray bit. So it's, but it is hematite. That the, there is a lot of there is that mineral does exist uh, on Mars. It's, it doesn't is. cover the whole planet, but it is there. Yeah. So questions keep coming in. I think you're just <laughs> well. You do you want me to curiosity? Well, do you want me, me to do a little bit about water? Do you want me to do that part, and then we can get back do, to, to let's those? do three more questions. Okay, um, you got it. and then I'll hand it back over to you, and I'll just keep monitoring. And when we break again, um, we'll just read them all off. So sounds good. Um, we're familiar with Earth having you know a tilt and seasons, and you know there's a correlation between a tilt and a, you know the seasons. So Mark W. would like to know if Mars has that same kind of thing and what causes that tilt. Yep. So um, how the planets got their specific tilts, we don't know. Um, could be they run got run into early on, kind of tipped them over a little bit. Um, one of the prevailing theories about the planet Uranus, the reason it's tipped over like this 
is uh, is because it may have gotten hit by something. Uh, but Mars does have a tilt. Its tilt is slightly more than Earth's tilt. So it's about 24-ish degrees. Earth is about 23 and a half degrees. And um, the, the, the tilt itself can change. And that's due to a little bit. And that's due to the gravitational interactions of some of the other planets like Jupiter and Saturn. Um, Earth, same thing. And um, and we have those we have seasons because of the tilt, and same thing for Mars. Um, the difference on Mars for seasons, though, is on Earth, our our closeness or farness from the sun does not impact our seasons. It is purely due to the tilt and how high and low the sun is in the sky. The difference in how close or far we are from the sun. In other words, doesn't have an effect on our on our seasons. On Mars, though, the close and far point are are far enough apart that it can have an effect on the seasons. So, for example, northern hemisphere winter is a little bit warmer on Mars than southern hemisphere winter uh, because the far point from the sun uh, for Mars coincides about with the southern hemisphere winter. So that's why it gets cold enough for a specific component of the air called carbon dioxide to freeze to the ground um, at, at the Southern Hemisphere winter. Cool. Okay, so Rich has a question. He is wondering if the temperature of a moon would also determine how round it is. He says, I imagine that a hot plastic moon would be more likely to become round. Is that true? Um. I would say something that's more plastic would then be affected by the gravitational pull of something big nearby. So it wouldn't necessarily be round. It might be oblong. Um, so it, it's still, uh, if it's if it's warm, it would, mm, I don't think that would still be enough to, to pull it into a round shape, but it may be affected by, like if it was a, uh, a something that was really close to the sun and and it, it may not be enough to to do this but it may be enough to do this interesting Maybe. okay so i'm going to call this the last question before we um continue and i know other questions are coming in keep sending them in we'll, <laughs> i see that we'll chat number keep many, going up <laughs> yeah we'll answer as many as we can sure. um gavin would like to know when will people be able to go to Mars? Is it realistic that that movie, The Martian with Matt Damon might happen in the next few years? Or are we gonna be talking about like, you know, the space race to the moon, but you know, with Mars? Can you tell ever us since, ever since I was, yeah, ever since I was a kid. Yeah, we'll get to Mars in about 30 years. It's been like 30 years the whole time. So um, it's- So we'll see you in 30 years. <laughs> yeah, see you in about 30 years. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know. I think the the folks who might get to Mars first might be SpaceX. Uh, I would not be surprised if they're the ones who tried it first, um, just because they can take more risk, um, and they're not spending. Well, they kind of are spending taxpayer money right now, but they're they they wouldn't be necessarily for that. I don't know. Is is the Martian realistic? Some aspects of that movie are realistic. Um, some of the stuff having to do with uh, uh, dust storms on Mars, that was not realistic. But full disclosure, the author of that book fully knew he was getting some stuff wrong. Um, and he, he, he had to do it to make the, the story work. So, okay. um, yeah. So I, I have no idea. I really don't. It's okay. tw well, 30 years in the future. <laughs> So we'll just pay attention for the next 30 years and in there 30 years go. we'll reassess. It'll be um, so another 30. We do have more questions coming in. I'm going to I'm going to pause it there and hand it back over to you Michelle, but I just want to remind everybody if you have questions just type them into the chat. I will make sure to ask them um, of Michelle assuming that we have plenty of time and that Michelle and will By the them. way, I this is my first time doing a program for the Glen Ellen Public Library. Oh my God, guys, you win in terms of chat interaction and question asking. Already, I've been doing these programs for more than 20 years. You all win. 
<laughs> this I is the most you. questions I've gotten. Yep. I, told I was told. You. I said the first I thing told. I said when you logged in was <laughs> be ready because they will have questions. That's totally cool. It makes this so much more fun for me too. So it's really all right. fun. Let's uh, let's get going. So I'm going to go back to my PowerPoint and the question having to do with water on Mars. Is there water there now? That is a big giant question mark. So um, we started seeing evidence for water on Mars decades ago. Prior to then, we thought of that Mars was just like a dry desert. Um, and so again, you can see in this picture what sure looks like dried riverbeds, right? You take a look at it and you go, I don't even have to know what's going on on Mars. That's exactly what that looks like. Uh, so this picture was taken by one of the Viking missions back in the 1970s. Um, and you can see more, I mean, this is just a couple pictures that I picked out. This, these weren't the only ones that, that showed evidence of liquid water on the surface of Mars. In this case, um, you can tell that crater formed um, and it compressed the rock. It made it a little more dense, a little harder to, to erode. Um, and there was probably a, a pond or, or a big ridge of, of water right here. And it broke through that, that rock wall and flowed around the crater. And because the crater rock was a little more dense, a little harder, um, it stayed and the water went around the crater. At least that's sure what that looks like. Um, there is evidence for ice under the surface of Mars. I mentioned we thought Mars was a dry desert. It's actually a frozen desert. Um, and so the picture on the left was a, a, a new crater. So stuff still hits Mars. Things hit other things in the solar system. Um, and it, it excavated um, or it uh, uncovered some ice, some water ice same stuff that's in your freezer, uh, that's, that was under the surface, not too far under the surface either. And a few months later, they went back and took a look and that, that ice has vaporized in that time period. So we see this happening a lot. Here's another example. There was a spacecraft mission called Mars Phoenix and it landed near the North Pole of Mars, not at the North Pole, but not too far away. And it had a scoop and they took the scoop and went across the surface. They, they scraped the scoop and about two inches <clears throat> below the surface, excuse me, about two inches below the surface, um, you can see that whitish stuff, that's ice, that's water ice. And you, and I think you can see my, my cursor, um, those little, those little, those little bits, those little whitish bits on the left, that's ice. And they went back four days later, again, the ice had vaporized. The air pressure on Mars is not enough to keep that ice, uh, totally ice-like on the surface, it will eventually um, vaporize. So they've done some studies to figure out like, wow, if the ice just isn't at the ice caps at the poles, there's ice under the surface. There's a lot of ice under the surface. Um, this is a map of Mars spread out on a flat surface. So it's a round map on a flat surface. So that's why it looks a little weird. The edges, the top and bottom edges are at the poles. The middle is at the equator. The blue and purple colors uh, are indicating water ice that's less than a foot below the surface. In other words, you go to Mars, you take a shovel, you go to one of these blue purple places, you dig down less than a foot and you're gonna hit water ice. The red color indicates water ice that's two feet or more below the surface. So you just have to dig down a little farther <laughs> to get it. So um, the, um, the black area indicates places where it's so dusty that if you tried to land a spacecraft there, your spacecraft would probably start to sink into the dust. So the white box, the white outline, is showing where the people who put this map together, where they think the best place for humans to land on the surface of Mars would be to then be able to uh, not sink into the dust, so that's a good thing, um, and be able to get at some of this water ice that's there so you can use it. Um, you can melt it so you can drink it. You can separate it into hydrogen and oxygen. You can breathe the oxygen. You can use the hydrogen for fuel. Um, so there's a whole lot of stuff you can do with this ice. So anyway, I found that this is a really great multi-purpose map um, to show where that water ice is. It's not just at the poles. 
um, but also where people are even starting to think about landing on the surface of Mars. Not that they're going to get there anytime soon, <laughs> but where they could land. But in terms of landing, we have landed some spacecraft on Mars. Um, and you can see Mars Phoenix is over there to the upper left and where Viking 1, Viking 2 landed. So the Vikings were in the late 70s. Um, Pathfinder uh, and Sojourner Rover, that was 1997. Uh, Spirit and Opportunity were 2004. Curiosity was 2012. And Insight, which was a lander, not a rover, uh, was 2008. Uh, is either 2008 or 2009. And then where it says Mars 2020, that's Perseverance. So before they had the official name Perseverance, uh, they called it Mars 2020. So you'll see that name used interchangeably in some of these pictures. Um, but how big are we talking? So Sojourner, the the model there is the one that's the smallest. Uh, Spirit Opportunity is the one off to the left. And Spirit and Opportunity were basically twins, so they only show one for the two. And then the one on the right is uh, Curiosity, and then Perseverance will look almost exactly like um, Curiosity. Oh, wait a minute. Maybe that's Curiosity. Maybe that's Perseverance. Oh, I'm getting myself confused. I overthink my answers. Um, anyway, it's one of them. And <laughs> actually, I think that's, I think that's Curiosity. Um, but basically, Perseverance is exactly the same. And it's just got different science instruments on it. So it's the size of a car. Perseverance weighs a little over 2,000 pounds. This is a giant, giant vehicle. Um, and trying to land that on Mars is pretty tough. I'll show you a little video on how they're going to do that. Um, but we've seen evidence for water all over the place. Look at this. This look, sure looks like a... A river channel dumping into a crater, right? This is Gusev Crater, and this is where Spirit landed in 2004. And you take a little close up, and you can see it. Man, it looks like the the water just kind of flowed right into that crater. So that's why they landed Spirit there, because they wanted to find evidence that there was water here. I love this picture because this really gives you a sense of it as a place. Um, the arrow indicates where Spirit drove to. So it landed in one of the flat parts there and it drove up the hills. Um, but it got up into one of the hills and uh, its wheels, one of its wheels kind of dug a trench of sorts. Um, so they took a picture of that trench and they went, huh, that's interesting. Let's, let's go study that stuff. What is that? Um, and they did that the whole time for the whole mission. What they wanted to find was evidence of liquid water in this place. All the rocks that they studied were volcanic rocks. I mean, literally every single one of them was a rock that at some point came from some volcano on Mars. They went and studied this stuff, especially that white stuff. Um, they found this material called silica. Silica is silicon dioxide. In this case, it is so concentrated that the only way that we know of to get that much silica in one spot is if water was there to do it. Um, this likely was the area on Mars where they had a hot spring. This is 90% silica. Um, and so these minerals, some of the minerals that they found in this place um, included minerals that only form when liquid water is around. What they came to the conclusion was, yes, Gusev Crater held a lake a long time ago, but in the intervening billion years or whatever it is, the volcanic dust and rock and stuff filled in the bottom of the crater. So when we're driving spirit on the bottom of the crater, they're not actually at the bottom of the crater. It's on top of the dust that filled in the crater. And the way they got the evidence that liquid water was here was to drive up higher into the hills. So there you go. Um, another mineral they found was this. Um, these are uh, called calcium sulfate minerals. One form of calcium sulfate is better known as plaster of Paris. Another one is the mineral gypsum. That's another calcium sulfate mineral. You know gypsum probably. Um, if you've ever, uh, if you've got walls uh, at home where you're, you're not going to nail into the wall and oops, you hit the wall a little too hard and you crack through the paper on the drywall and you got that crumbly stuff underneath, that's gypsum. 
So your drywall in your house is, is the same minerally stuff um, that's on Mars. And this was hot minerally water that flowed through the cracks of these rocks. And so the water went and the minerals got left behind. And so that's, that's the, the white streaks that you see in these rocks. A uh, couple more and then we'll stop for some more questions. Um, the channels that you see here you go, okay, yeah, looks like some water. All right, cool. And we look a little closer, you go, okay, some pebbles. Until you realize the scale of this picture. These pebbles are the size of a house, each one. And where they think these channels came from was there was an ocean here or a shallow one something from space smashed into the ocean, formed a tsunami. Uh, you might call it a tidal wave, but tsunami is a better term. So then that tsunami flowed out and moved these rocks, moved the, the rock and formed these channels, these rivulets, and moved these house-size boulders. Every single one of those little rocks that you see in here is a house-size boulder. So how cool is that? Probably boulders left behind by a tsunami when something from space smashed into the ocean on Mars. Um, and then uh, for my friend that mentioned uh, Gale Crater and Mount Sharp, this is Mount Sharp and this is Gale Crater. So if you take a look, this is Curiosity and way off in the distance, you can see the edge of Gale Crater right there, kind of peeking up on the edge. And this is Mount Sharp. It's about three miles tall, I mentioned. So the goal was land in the flat spot, drive toward Mount Sharp. And uh, what they want to do is study the rocks on Mount Sharp and the lower rocks they figure are the oldest rocks. And as you get higher on Mount Sharp, those are probably younger rocks. So if you study the rocks along the way, you can put the story together of the rocks here and, and the conditions that were here when the rocks were laid down. Well, here's one example. Um, this is a picture of Mars. Uh, taken by Curiosity, not too long after it landed, it was still driving along the flat spot, all right, driving along where, where it landed, traveling toward Mount Sharp. It hadn't gotten to Mount Sharp yet. And they took this picture and they went, huh, that's interesting. Take a look at the picture on the right. Sure looks exactly the same, right? You've got rounded rocks concreted together on the right. On the left, rounded rocks concreted together. How did this happen? A river. So this was a river, and you can actually see evidence of that river um, on the edge of Gale Crater. And the river went down along the, the uh, went went down along the edge of the crater, flowed out and spread out in inside Gale Crater down at the bottom. So Curiosity found evidence of a freshwater river, and this water was clean enough that you could have like taken a glass out and dunked it in the water and drank it. This wasn't a hot briny spring. This wasn't like a salty ocean. This was fresh water. Um, so how cool is that? Um, and it's not like we were trying to look for this. This was something they went, what's that? And went over and took a look. That's the way this science works. They don't know what they're gonna find when they go there. How about this? Ancient dried mud. This is dried mud on Mars. Imagine ponds on the floor of Gale Crater. And the water dries up and this looks like any view of dried mud that you see here on Earth. Probably especially if you go to like the the southeast United States where the the soil is a lot more red than it is here. There you go. Dried mud. How about dried clay? Um, this is dried clay on the surface of Mars. You need water to make clay. And then when they drill into, use uh, Curiosity's rock drill to drill down into it, you can you can see that they drilled a hole. And then when they pulled the drill out, they actually pulled some of the clay out of the surface. So that's the whole thing moved. Pretty neat. Um, we'll do one more and then uh, we'll stop for a question. Whoops. There we go. Um, speaking of drills, uh, I love this picture. This is a relatively new set of pictures. So they, they put together all the drill holes from Curiosity, 29 in all. But look at all the colors. Mars is not just one color. The rocks are not just one color. You get different colors from different minerals. And you can see that from the drill holes, from the dust that came out of the interior of those rocks. So um, 
th this reflects the minerals and the fluids that passed through these ancient rocks. And drilling allows us to get into these rocks and not just study the outside. The inside is where uh, they get the most information from. So, all right, why don't we get to some more questions? Okay, so Kay would like to know, I think you mentioned this a little while ago, but um, Kay would like to know if Mars has carbon. Um, yes, it does. I Offhand, I don't know what the form is, but yes, it does. Um, uh, it's uh, like they've detected methane uh, on Mars. You need carbon to, to make methane. Um, uh, carbon and hydrogen, if I remember right. And if any chemists are out there and I just messed that up, please let me know. <laughs> Throw that in the chat. But yes, there is carbon there. And there's also oxygen and, um, oh, wait, of course there's carbon there. Oh, my goodness. Oh, mm. The air is made of carbon dioxide. So yes, there is a lot. Of, there's a lot of carbon there. So yes, well, I mean, there's a, there's, there's a lot of carbon in the atmosphere. But yes, there's carbon there. Oh, so I can't believe I just messed that up. That's okay. We won't fault you for it. Okay, so Rana would like to know if it would be possible for Mars to be knocked out of orbit by a large asteroid. If something was big enough to knock it out of orbit, it would destroy it. So the short answer is no. Um, um, so you're you're talking something that's that's four thousand miles in diameter. That would have to be an enormous object. Just to give you a sense of uh, Earth's early history, one of the ideas of where um, Earth's moon came from, one of the strong ideas for where Earth's moon came from, was something the size of Mars hit the early Earth, and some of the stuff that splashed out formed our moon. So if something the size of Mars could hit the Earth and not 100% destroy it and and knock it out of orbit, it's not like it would like be a pool ball and knock it out of orbit. It would break it apart before it would cause it to go someplace else. Got it. Well, we'll cross our fingers that that doesn't happen. As far as uh, we know. <laughs> as far as we know. Unlikely. So Anisha would like to know, assuming the atmosphere can be controlled, will Mars soil be able to support plants? Um, if you're talking about uh, Martian soil that you might be able to bring inside a greenhouse, yeah, you could probably condition the soil and make it uh, something that plants can can thrive in. Um, there is a, a material called perchlorate in in the soil um, that tends to make it less hospitable for plants. But as long as you know that, you could probably do something to the soil. It by itself, like if you dug up some Mars soil and planted some seeds, probably wouldn't do very well. You'd have to you'd have to get the soil ready to, to be able to grow some stuff, but um, okay. you could work with it or just bring So we're not working with like Midwestern topsoil here. No, so no, <laughs> no. It makes you, it makes you realize how amazing earth is when you look all over the solar system and we do not have like Midwestern topsoil any place else in the solar system. So. Got it. So Portia would like to know if it's possible to go and like test drive a Mars rover or even see one in the flesh. <laughs> Um, short answer, no. Um, longer answer, kind of. In a current pandemic situation, no. But um, the Jet Propulsion Lab in Pasadena, California is where uh, Curiosity was built, where Spirit and Opportunity were built, where Perseverance was built. And normally, I mean, that's a NASA facility. It's part of Caltech. Um, the Caltech campus, but it's a, it's a, it's, they're contracted to NASA. So it's a NASA facility. And normally, no, you can't just drive onto the campus there and go visit something. Uh, but every once in a while, JPL has open house and they do allow uh, ticketed people. I believe, I believe there are some restrictions like you have to be an American citizen. Basically, they got to be able to do a background check on you. Um, they don't just let everybody come. Um, and they, they limit the numbers, but they, they that can happen. So keep an eye out in, in the after times for maybe a future um, Jet Propulsion Lab open house. They usually, when they did it, they usually did it around May. 
it's not going to happen this year. Betcha it won't happen next year. But um, that's something to keep an eye out for if you happen to be in that area or you know you're going to be in that area. Uh, just just see if they might be running an open house. Um, otherwise, really that's cool. pretty much the only way to do it. I, w I went there um, 2007. And it was part of a conference that I was going to, and we had to sign up in advance, and it was a bus tour that we took, and we got to see what they call the Mars Yard, the indoor Mars Yard and the outdoor Mars Yard, which is where they had the, the mock-ups of the Spirit and Opportunity rovers. And they were starting to build uh, Curiosity at that point. And so we got to see one of the test models for, for Curiosity. That's so cool. Big. We'll yeah. cross our fingers for that vaccine so we can go yep. exactly. to California. Exactly. Um, so Robert would like to know, how do they determine what used to be fresh water and what used to be salt water on Mars? Yeah, it's basically the all the minerals that are left behind, um, how that water interacted with the rocks, depending on what was in the water that would determine what kind of minerals that you get in the rocks themselves. So you study the chemistry of the rocks and you go, oh, the only way you can get this stuff in the rocks is if this happens on Earth. So that means that's possibly what happened on Mars. Um, so we take what we know works here to get whatever that is, mineral, and we apply that to Mars. So Almost um, like a murder mystery. Yeah. It's, retracing all the stuff. Exactly. It's super fun. See, see, this is the this is the secret that we scientists don't want to be secret. Our our jobs are like this. My job is to help people observe the sky. Uh, I get to look through telescopes for a living and I get to uh, uh, explain uh, what's up there. I get to do programs. I get to play around in the observatory, which is where I was last Friday night, taking pictures with the big new telescope that we got. Um, these are jobs. These are real honest to goodness jobs that people get paid for. And so science is fun. You get to come up with stuff like this and maybe your experiment goes to Mars on a rover or something. So, so cool. yeah. All right. So high school students, listen up. You can get there a job looking through telescopes. Yep. Um, so Alan wrote in that he seemed to recall the Museum of Science and Industry having two drivable rovers in the space area. So if Portia, if you are looking to test drive a rover, that might be the place to go. I'm not aware of that, but it could be either an upcoming or a past exhibit. Yeah, Does it ring I a don't, bell to you, Michelle? I'm not sure. Um, at the Adler in one of our in our kids gallery, we had um, some little some small uh, little drivable rovers. Um, basically, you can get, this sounds kind of weird, but you can get uh, a, a remote controlled car. It's kind of the same thing. The only difference is they send lots of commands to the rover to then autonomously work through those commands um, because there's a long distance between Earth and Mars. And so the one way time to get a signal from Earth to Mars means you're not gonna sit here with a joystick. And, and operate the rovers. By the way, there's a car commercial that I hate. And, and some of the adults, you may know what car commercial I'm talking about, where the guy is, the, the rover's like zipping around and all of a sudden it falls over. And he said, oh, it was all wheel drive engaged on that? Didn't feel like it. I'm like, oh, come on, we don't do that. <laughs> First off, you're not gonna joystick the rover across Mars. And secondly, uh, Perseverance will travel about the rate that Curiosity travels, uh, which is less than two inches a second. So no speeding tickets on Mars. No. We'll just keep that in mind. <laughs> so Kay would like to know, um, she has a couple, I don't really know if Kay is man or woman, but uh, they would like to know if Mars has uh, blood moons. And I think I think what we're talking about is like, do you have a full moon of Phobos and a you know a new moon? Does, does it go through phases in the same way that our moon does? It it would. Um, I'm not sure if those phases would be evident from the surface because yeah, you're cause talking they're pretty small. You're, they're, yeah, they're pretty small. Um, for example, uh, Mars, uh, uh, the, the two moons can pass over the sun. And so you can get, you might call it an eclipse, but they're not big enough to cover the whole sun. So we call that a transit. 
Um, so yes, we have two words to describe the same thing. But an eclipse is when it covers the whole thing, and a transit is when it covers a little bit. Um, so these moons do transit the sun, uh, but they just don't cover the whole thing. Um, so I'm gonna guess that uh, yes, it would it would go through phases, but I honestly don't know if you would see them from the surface. I've never actually seen a picture of one, which makes me think um, either like someone something. thought to, to take that picture or you just can't see it. Got it. Well, something for one of our high school students to discover when they get a job looking through telescopes. There you go. And then the final question, and this is such a good one for right now, um, before we wrap up this session, we've got virus on the mind. And Kay would like to know, could a virus survive on Mars? That is something that there is literally a job out there called the Planetary Protection Officer. Uh, last time I heard it was a lady and I don't know her name. Um, I don't know if she's still in the job, but uh, I believe there was a lady in that job at least a few years ago. And the Planetary Protection Officer works for the Planetary Protection Office and their whole goal is to number one make sure that we are not contaminating other places with our stuff so we want to send spacecraft that are as clean as possible number two if we ever bring things back from other places that they will not contaminate here so um could a virus survive on the surface that is something that will have to be studied because there are life forms on Earth that are extraordinarily hardy. Look up, if you want some fun, look up the word tardigrade. Um, T-A-R-D-I-G-R-A-D-E, -E, tardigrade. These are little critters that live like in pond water and stuff here on Earth. And they have had tardigrades hitch rides on the outsides of spacecraft and gone up into Earth orbit been up there for years and years and they come back and they will reanimate they'll they'll they get kind of desiccated and dry and then when they have water re-added to them amazingly they're able to survive so if a tardigrade can do it betcha a virus could too <laughs> um we'll, we'll cross our fingers that won't yeah happen. exactly exactly I, okay, so but, that... but to uh, full disclosure, I don't know for certain. I'm I'm not a I'm not a virologist, so I don't know if say the the higher ultraviolet light levels on the surface of Mars because it has less air, no ozone layer, all that. I don't know if that would like break apart a virus or something like that. It could. So, um, but it's something intriguing to think about. It is really intriguing to think about. So that wraps up our questions for right now. All right. um, keep typing your questions in. I'll hand it back over to Michelle and we'll try to get to some questions later. Yep, we're in the home stretch. So um, now we're going to talk about the uh, Perseverance mission. Um, so here we go. Uh, this drawing shows you uh, curiosity on the left and Perseverance on the right. And you can see they're, they're basically the same form. Again, I mentioned that the science instruments are going to be a little different on perseverance than they were on curiosity but the the main way that the rover is built is almost exactly the same it's going to land in a place called a Jezero crater and I'll show you that in just a second and it will land February 18th the afternoon of February 18th um, so just a few weeks from now the rover's mission is going to search for signs in the rocks of Mars in Jezero crater that that area may have been uh, habitable for life. It will study geology um, and, and uh, the climate. I believe it has a weather station on it as well. And most intriguing, it's going to basically say, okay, we got some really interesting rocks here, but the best way for those to be studied is back on Earth. So how do we do that? We, we, don't, we can't return anything from there. How do, how do we do that? So it has a system where it's going to collect some rocks, put them in some tubes, and basically deposit the tubes on the surface of Mars and leave them there. So that when we have the capability to send something to Mars, land there, pick up the tubes, bring them back. Um, that mission is not on the table right now, 
they are betting on the fact that we will have that capability at some point in the future. Cool thing, they will have rocks all ready to go and packaged up. So it has instruments on board to study rocks, but the best way we can really say for certain whether or not maybe there were signs of past life or at least the the area of that of that crater may have been friendly to life uh, if life existed then the best way to do that is to get those rocks back on earth where we can study them with a lot better equipment than we can send to mars all right so jezero crater um come on there we go so jezero crater this is not a real color picture uh, but the greener colors indicate higher altitude the blue color indicates lower altitude take a look it looks like there's a river channel right cutting through the edge of that of the top left of that crater the circle indicates the landing zone for the perseverance rover i'm going to give you some numbers mars about 4000 miles in diameter this landing circle six miles in diameter and so they are aiming for one specific spot on mars they launched from earth they've taken a curved path about 300 million miles long so even though i said the the two orbits are about 45 million miles apart when you've got the full length of the path to get there um, then that comes to about 300 million miles put another way we're we're launching a golf ball from los angeles and hitting a hole in one at a golf course in scotland so it is an extremely precise part of mars that, that we're landing at when they launched perseverance for mars they're basically launching it so that it meets up with mars so mars is not at that location when it when it when it launches they were betting that they've got it time just right that it will meet up that the two of them will meet up in one place and not only that that this thing will go directly down to that spot on mars it's pretty cool um but anyway they're landing uh, perseverance in this place because it sure looks like an ancient shoreline and the um the the color that's been added to this picture uh, indicates the, the green indicates minerals called carbonates on earth those are usually really good at preserving fossilized evidence of fossilized life on earth so we'll look for those on on mars doesn't mean life actually was there but if it's going to be preserved anywhere this would be the best place uh, on mars that they could identify there is a little guy hitching a ride. His name is Ingenuity, or her name is Ingenuity. I don't know if anyone has identified if this is a he or she or a they. Um, this is uh, Ingenuity, the helicopter. And uh, this is riding on the bottom of Perseverance, and you can see it right there. So those are those uh, flat blades. This is a demonstration mission about two months after Perseverance lands. This uh, helicopter is gonna get dropped off by uh, Perseverance and Perseverance is gonna roll out of the way and they're gonna attempt to fly a helicopter on Mars. This will be the first time that a, a craft will have attempted powered controlled flight on Mars. So stay tuned for something on that. It may work, it may not. That's the fun part of a demonstration mission. And um, there's no guarantee that this is gonna work but it could. Uh, so they figured, why not? This could be a future way that we explore Mars. Can you imagine a bunch of these things um, traveling to Mars and, and landing in certain spots and then you can send little helicopters around? Uh, it has a little solar panel at the top. So who knows? That could be pretty fun. Um, I do, one last thing I wanna show you. I do wanna show you how Perseverance is going to arrive at Mars. Um, so I'm gonna switch the share here and i'll talk over it and amy can you still hear me yes i can good okay i muted the tab and i wanted to make sure i didn't mute myself okay so um perseverance has a heat shield it's it's arriving in a in a kind of a cone shape um uh, structure it has a heat shield it will slow down using a parachute the heat shield will drop off then this contraption called a sky crane will do powered flight down to the surface 
and it will lower perseverance by a set of wires. As soon as it registers that perseverance is sitting on the ground, then the guide wires will break or they'll cut and this thing will will uh, move away and uh, crash on purpose. So there you go. I've just explained in like literally one minute um, how uh, uh, what's going to take about about seven minutes in total. So the entire top of the atmosphere down to the ground takes about seven minutes. Um, so there's uh, on the day that uh, Perseverance arrives, there's about an 11 minute one way light signal um, to from Mars to Earth. So when we get to about 10 minutes prior to landing, getting that signal on Earth, it has already landed on Mars. We're waiting for that signal to get to Earth. And there's nothing we can do to fix it if something goes wrong. No matter what, it's arriving February 18th. It will get there in either one piece or many pieces. So fingers crossed that it actually goes well. And with that, uh, let's let's dive into a few more questions. So uh, I hope that the mission will, will will succeed. I hope they send back pictures. It's going to be a while before they send back some decent pictures. They'll get a handful to start with, but don't expect a flood of pictures um, from from Perseverance. It'll they'll probably start taking some heavy duty pictures maybe a month or two after. Uh, after it lands. So they'll get a, a few to start with, uh, but the first thing they have to do is get this thing successfully to Mars. So uh, February 18th, it will get the confirmation one way or another um, at about 2.55 p.m. Chicago time. Wow. So that's the seven minutes of terror that we've that been seeing is the in the seven, news. Yes, that is the seven minutes of terror from the top of the atmosphere to the ground is seven minutes of the scientists just watching their computer screens because they cannot do anything at that point. They are just checking to see, is this thing sending back the right data saying that it has done all those pieces, all that entire chain has to work. The heat shield that this thing has to be pointed in the right direction because if it's angled too far in one direction, it could skip off the atmosphere or it could burn up. We need the heat shield to come off. We need the parachute to come out. We need the sky crane to, de to detach. We need the sky crane to lower the rover. We need the sky crane to lower the rover to the ground and not crash it into the ground. We need those cables to snap and uh, to break. If they don't, then the sky crane, when its, when it's rocket fuel is out, it'll fall on top of curiosity or of uh, perseverance, sorry. Um, and, uh, and so we need all that to work. And then kind of amazing. It, it's rather amazing. And once then when that all happens, then they need to be able to make sure all the instruments work and all the cameras work and everything is deployed properly and and all that. Because if something goes wrong early on, it's it's kind of hard to recover from that because you can't like go there and turn a wrench or something. So um, there it's 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 kind of nerve wracking. Um, but we did land Curiosity this way. So they're one for one. So we'll see how it goes. <laughs> so what will you be doing on February 18th? Do you think you'll be at work? Will you be planted yes. in front of your TV? What's the, nope. what's your, what's your yeah, day to so be like? We are going to be hosting the Mars Rover uh, landing watch party on YouTube. So if you would like to join the Adler Planetarium's YouTube channel, um, it's free. You just have to, to sign on. And uh, we will be on from 1 to 3 p.m. And we're going to be taking people through some of the uh, some of the uh, stuff we know about Mars. We'll be showing people some pre-recorded video of a few of the exhibits at the Adler. So if you haven't visited in a while or uh, maybe you haven't visited at all, we'll show you some of our Mars-related exhibits. I'm actually going into the office tomorrow to record some of those pre-recorded pieces. Um, and so, yeah, we will be having our watch party while NASA is doing their watch party. But the cool thing about ours is you can send us questions and we will answer your questions or we'll try to answer as many as we can. Um, well, hopefully and... nobody from Glen Ellen goes to that because you'll just be overwhelmed with questions. <laughs> no, we actually were anticipating that today and not necessarily Glen Ellen specifically, but um, 
I we timed out the script and I'm like, well, we're about half an hour short, but we're going to err on the side of this stuff always takes longer than you think it will <laughs> to, to run a live show. And, um, and we can always fill the time with questions. That is not the hard part. So, okay. So maybe you do want everybody from Glen Ellen. To I go do. To your... I do. <laughs> yes. Yes. We do want people to, to come, please. Actually, if you come to our watch party and you were in the audience tonight, please say, to I'll alert our moderators web two YouTube moderators. Um, I'll alert them to be on the lookout for anybody who mentions the Glen Ellen Public Library. So yeah. I'll make sure I'll make sure that they uh, that they get that info to me. Um, yeah, name so. drop us. We'd love that. Yeah, that'd be awesome. I would so love to. So we have to. a couple of uh, questions that have come in. And is do you have another segment of your presentation, or are you just taking questions at this point? Questions at this point. Basically, um, the the whole goal for Mars has been following the water, finding this evidence for water. We have been leading up to this, this Perseverance mission to find evidence, potentially, of past life on Mars, or at least the conditions were right for past life on Mars. We don't know if we'll, we'll get that, but um, that's, that's where we're going. So um, Mars is a really interesting place. Uh, but it's it makes really you appreciate Earth that much more. So yeah. So uh, Portia, you answered this already, but she had a question, and that is um, whether Perseverance, the landing pattern, was going to be exactly the same as Curiosity. So we've already done it once. Yep. Uh, and do you, do there's you think there's it can one be done twice. Yep. Yeah. Well. We have no choice. <laughs> yeah, we'll find yeah. out. Right? We'll find out. Um, but the but the neat thing about um, Perseverance's landing system is that it has a, a better system for um, identifying obstacles on the ground. So I think Curiosity could have done that a bit, but uh, Perseverance's system is actually pretty. It's supposed to be pretty robust to be able to go, oh, there's a big boulder there. I will move over here. Um, so then move that whole sky crane over um, to be able to try to avoid uh, big obstacles that, because you don't want to land the rover so that its wheels are kind of wonky and, and you want to land it on flat ground if possible. So, so it will have That's a better system for being able to do that. That's amazing. It sounds like something right out of a science fiction book, to be <laughs> honest. Um, Kay, wrote in and corrected me on her gender. She's in fifth grade and her real name is Kira. She oh. would like to know how long Perseverance's mission will be. So these missions usually are about two years, but they almost always get extended. So uh, the missions for Spirit and Opportunity were supposed to be 90 days. Spirit lasted from 2004 to 2011. An opportunity lasted from 2004 until 2000, was it 19, 18? I think it was something like that. Um, 14 years, 15 years. So again, the, the, the missions were supposed to have been 90 days long and it lasted for, your opportunity lasted for over a decade. So NASA builds these things really, really well. Pretty sturdy. Um, so, yeah, so as long as everything is working well and, um, uh, there isn't some major glitch that, that causes the rover to shut down or something like that, then nominally two years, probably longer than that. And so then what happens to them when they when their mission is over? Do they just kind of become like rusty cars in a car lot or do they, well, they get fixed they, up somehow? Nope, nope. They then become part of Mars. Um, so we currently have several spacecraft that are just sitting there and have been this whole time. The two Vikings, Insight, uh, well, no, Insight's still working. Uh, uh, Phoenix, um, Phoenix probably got run over by by a, a polar ice cap, though, so it's probably literally in pieces right now. Um, uh, Spirit, Opportunity, um, yeah, they're all just sitting there. Relics on names. Mars. Um, so Anisha would like to know, um, now that we know that Mars has water and ice on it, what's the next big question that we're hoping to answer about Mars? What do we really um, need to know? So just 
uh, we don't know if Mars has liquid water on anywhere on it. It had it in the past. Where did it go? Is there any there now? Is it under the surface? What happened to it? What was Mars's atmosphere like in the distant past? Um, these places on Mars that look like they were they were rivers, were they? Or was it some other mechanism that created rivers without liquid water? Was it ice? Was it something else? Um, was there life on Mars? Is there is there life on Mars now? Um, could people live on Mars? All the stuff then about how, how do we do that? How could we build a habitat? So every time you answer a question, there's there's like 50 there's more so many to come up. Yeah. That's the, that's the other fun part about science. You never find everything out. <laughs> that's really cool. Um, Kay, I'm sorry, Portia would like to know how she can name a rover. So just keep an, yeah, just keep an eye out for uh, NASA's website. Whenever they have a spacecraft, a lot of times they'll have a naming contest. And so that's what this was. And people suggested names, it was kids, students who suggested names. And uh, there was one student uh, like I said, a seventh grader from, I believe it was Virginia, uh, suggested perseverance. And usually you have to uh, submit a few sentences, like a little paragraph or something, a little essay on why, why that name. So it's not just, I think it should be named Bodie McBoatface. Um, <laughs> you got to come up with a reason. Why do you want it named Bodie McBoatface? Uh, if you don't know the answer about Bodie, or if you don't know the story behind Bodie McBoatface, look that up. It's it's okay. It's totally cool. It's on the up and up. Um but uh, uh, these these contests happen often. So a lot of times the team names the spacecraft, but for stuff like this, they'll have a contest for it. So Cool. So Portia, I think maybe just keep watching NASA's maybe social media, yeah. watch the NASA yep. website. Yep. Um, they're doing all kinds of cool stuff that I think most of us in the general public just don't even know about. Yeah. Um, and then I just see the one last question, unless anybody else has anything they'd like to ask of Michelle. Mimi would like to say thank you so much. Um, she is a regular on the Adler's YouTube channel and a big fan. So Mimi, I hope that you watch the, you know, the landing party and you, you know, tell Michelle that you watch this program at the Glen Ellen Public Library so we can get a shout out. Yep. Um, one more question just came in. Rich would like to know, could the flow patterns we see on Mars have been caused by liquid CO2 instead of liquid H2O? Um, more than likely not. To get liquid CO2, you have to have uh, the right temperatures and pressures. It would have to be a really, uh, either really high air pressure or, or uh, in some combination of low uh, temperature. So, it's why we don't have liquid CO2 on Earth unless you have it in like a like a like a bottle, like a the uh, a container to be able to do that. Because um, we don't have the right air pressure to have liquid carbon dioxide. We can have gas in the atmosphere. You can have ice, which is dry ice, but there's no liquid CO2. We just don't have the right conditions here. Um, so anyway, it up in the air as to what exactly those flow patterns were caused by. It sure looks like water. Uh, it sure has the, for these minerals and stuff, there's just no other way we know of to get some of this stuff uh, on, on the surface. So anyway, um, basically until we get real people's boots on the ground and, and some really great uh, science equipment and we can test this stuff and and really find out for certain if if that really was liquid water um there's always a little little twinge of doubt but um for the future that's what makes something. it interesting yeah that's what makes it interesting so i think we're about ready to wrap up um but i have one final question for you um anybody who came to this program tonight if there's one thing that they remember what do you hope it is <sighs> few things and I know you said one thing but I can never <laughs> limit okay. myself to just one thing um remember as you're watching if you're watching the NASA show about the landing or or our show or whatever 
NASA makes this look really easy, and it's not. It is extraordinarily difficult. None of this is 100% guaranteed. It could crash. Um, that that could happen. It has happened in the past. Um, happened about 20 years ago or so with some small spacecraft that crashed on Mars. A couple of them crashed. And so just remember that it takes a really big team of people, men, women, everybody, and, and, and a seventh grade student, um, to be able to get this thing successfully to Mars or not. It may not work. Um, so that's always the chance you take. But in, in astronomy, in science, you take chances. And the reward is you get to operate a spacecraft on the surface of another planet. So I would say together that's, that's what I'd like people to remember. Um, no guarantees, uh, but the reward is is really cool stuff. Cool. Well, thank you so much. If you have additional questions, you can contact us at the library. We'd be happy to get in contact with Michelle for you or maybe something that we can help you discover on your own. Um, I just want to say thanks again to Michelle for um, giving us her time and her energy and knowledge um, to put on this wonderful program. Hope to see everybody at some hookah programs coming up. Um, and with that, I think we'll just call it a night. Thank you so much, everyone. And definitely, if you watch our Mars Rover Landing Watch Party, give, your, give the Glen Ellen Public Library a shout out, and I'll make sure that information gets to me, and I will recognize you guys on the air. I would love to do that. Thank you so much, Michelle. <laughs> Thanks, everyone, for coming. Hope you had fun. Uh, we'll be posting this on social media um, after the program, so feel free to share it with your friends if they couldn't come tonight.